Good afternoon and welcome to Writers Unplugged. This is a series that will air throughout the year in support of Cleveland Reads. Writers Unplugged is a chance to hear your favorite writers or perhaps new to you writers in conversation as if you were eavesdropping on them in a coffee shop. Cleveland Reads is an initiative to improve the literacy levels in our community and Mayor Bibb has challenged Clevelanders to read 1 million books or 10 million minutes. My name is Jen Jumba. I'm a librarian here at Cleveland Public Library. And one of my favorite things besides reading is talking to writers. It's an opportunity to get to know their craft, what inspires their stories, where they like to write, essentially getting to know them better than and seeing them as human beings and not just the name on the spine of a book. Before we get started, a couple things to find out who else is visiting, go to writers unplugged slash well, I'm sorry, go to clevelandreads.com backslash unplugged. There are in-person visits as well as virtual. Carol and John's Comic Shop in West Park, which is a treasure of a comic book shop, has copies of Stealth Hammer for you. And then take a moment, let us know where you're watching. And if you have questions about the characters, the story research, let me know. If you join me in a warm welcome to Ryan Drost, local writer of Stealth Hammer. Hello. Thanks for having hey. me. Absolutely. I know several of you might be watching from Cleveland Public Library branches. So hello. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the comments. I will be sure to ask Ryan. He enjoys having questions from fans. I absolutely so, do. So. <laughs> so we'll start at the beginning. Where did the name Stealth Hammer come from? So that's always the fun one. So that was actually a nickname of my wife. Uh, so the character is inspired by my wife. She works as a graphic designer. So before anyone thinks it was a negative nickname, it was not. <laughs> she works as a graphic designer and at one place that she worked at, an uh, ad agency, she like basically submitted one submission when others had submitted multiple and she, the client chose her name so or her idea. And so her boss next time was like, watch out for stealth. So that kind of became a nickname for her for a while. Okay. But she um, she worked at another ad agency where she was kind of in charge of brand compliance, which means she was in charge of saying, like, this is the color to use. This is the right font to use, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so her boss was like, "Or oh, you're the one that has to lay the hammer down. So then she, <laughs> I did the two together. It became a stealth hammer. And I always joked, like, we always joked around saying, like, that's a cool superhero name. Like, you're a real life superhero. And Absolutely. Then, for her birthday one year, I got uh, I commissioned an artist to draw her as a superhero. And once I actually saw the actual drawing, like physical manifestation of her as a superhero, I was like, OK, yeah. maybe we have something here. Yeah. And then we just got into creating this this whole world that we have now created. So that's terrific. I think everybody right now listening is probably thinking about the two nicknames that they've had recently and whether or not they would go together. <laughs> <laughs> to make a superhero. And I'm thinking about mine and I'm thinking mm, probably not. <laughs> and you can actually uh, actually on our uh, website, the Stealth Hammer website, which is just stealthhammer.com, you can see the original drawing that was you that was done that kind of inspired everything. So it looks very different because it looks much more like my wife in real life than it does okay. what Stealth Hammer eventually looked like. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a cool concept uh, to world building. So Absolutely. It's a great concept. So I'm going to um, hold up the two covers, right? So on the cover is Jamie, yeah. right? Also known as Stealth Hammer. So can you introduce us to her and tell us a little bit more about her? Yeah. So she is uh, just going into college. Uh, so she's graduated from high school. She's going into college. She, she has a dad who is this world-renowned <laughs> scientist inventor guy. Her mom is a world-traveling uh, interior designer. So she's got a lot of like expectations on her and so okay. she decides she wants to go into graphic design well it's characters based on my wife so that's why she goes into graphic yeah. design um and they she finds out through these stories that she's actually part of like a family legacy of protectors of the planet and uh through little hints and every suggestions and everything in the first issue and we really reveal it in the second issue mm -hmm. she finds out that this darkness this big bad that that her family thought was gone has resurfaced and she gains these powers and these abilities through a bit of accident and a bit <laughs> of uh, a bit of destiny and uh, yeah. as any good superhero has happened. So, and she, yeah, she finds out that she's got these abilities now and what is she going to do with them? And uh, she, 
she has this adventurous spirit, which she got from her grandmother, which she mentions in the story as well. Mm -hmm. Her grandmother has been missing for la the last five years. And she finds out like that her grandmother had superpowers also. And she's like, it's just, as you can imagine, it's just very overwhelming, but she has this positive spirit. She yeah. doesn't believe in giving up. In fact, her tagline is that this is not, that's not how this story ends. That's her tagline. Yeah. And so uh, it's a great meta type of tagline because it's, we're telling a story. It doesn't end just yet. And right. at the same time, it's, it's about never giving up. So, Absolutely. I'm joined by local comic book writer, Ryan Drost. And I have to say how much I enjoyed um, the, the comments about her grandmother and seeing the pictures in the house, yeah. you know, of the places that she's traveled and the things and the adventures that she's had. And it's almost prophetic that perhaps... Jamie, you know, Stealth Hammer will kind of follow in those footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. And we will, as the story progresses, we'll also get some flashback stories to her grandmother and stories okay. involving her. So some of those paintings that we saw in the background will play some roles in future stories. Um, one of the things that's really fun when you're doing a comic book is it is a collaborative effort. Okay. So I'm working with with artists and creators. And my main artist is Joel Jackson. He did the main story and the second issue. Um, and he's from Columbus, uh, so he's, a, he's an Ohio, Ohio person, which yeah. is fantastic. But uh, oftentimes I'm writing to him uh, in the story, so I'm telling him, here's what I want to have happen, and we'll talk about a story. And sometimes I will get very detailed about what I want on a page because it's very important what's on the page. And then there's other right. times where I just put a couple sentences, and he – does exactly what you saw, which is he has all these paintings now in the background. And I never, I just said, there's gonna be family paintings in the room. And he puts all these things in there. Yeah. And he knows that once I see his artwork, now that starts becoming part of the story. And that okay. I start thinking ahead, okay, how can I use these paintings? How can I use these to help tell the story? So there's often times where I come up with characters and ideas that tell the story. And then there's times where he puts something into the artwork that then becomes part of the story. Um, yeah. So a great example of that is in the on the cover of the first issue, which I have right here. Um, this is the main, the cover A. There's all these little robots that are like flying around mm -hmm. uh, and everything else. And they're known as the Labites. Well, Joel was drawing the, her father, the doc, Dr. Everett is his name. Mm -hmm. and he, he drew this little robot sitting on his shoulders, just a concept drawing. And I was like, oh, I really like that. That's really cool. And he's like, yeah, I thought he'd have like these little assistants that would help him out because he's really busy. And I was like, I love that. That's a great idea. Yeah. I was like, go with it. And next thing I know, there was a cover with eight robots on the cover. And I said to him, I was like, I texted him. I was like, you do know I now have to come up with names for all of these characters. <laughs> I have to give them all personalities. I have to create a backstory yeah. for them. Uh so, but at the same time, I don't want to overwhelm the reader. So like in the second issue, you get introduced to a few of them and right. we'll more and more of them until we get all eight of them. So things like that happen where it's like, okay, he threw something in he thought would make sense. Now they're part of the story. They're part of the mythos. So, yeah. Well, um, Joel Jackson is your artist. Yeah. Um, is he the one that originally drew the picture of your wife or? No, that okay. was. Just, How yeah. did you? Find, find Joel. How did you yeah. find somebody to do the artwork? So uh, I originally, so the original drawing was just, I went to a con comic convention and okay. found an artist who I liked their work and I, you know, had them draw her. Um, then I went and I found uh, through a couple comic friends that I have, uh, comic creator friends, because I've done a podcast for 12, uh, 14 years now. Okay. Um, and I've gotten to interview a lot of, much like what you do, I got to interview a lot of comic creators and get to know them yeah. and everything. And so they, uh, one of them connected me with a student of his, and she did a lot of the early concept art. And her, she did a five-page story with me, which is in the back of issue one. Okay. Uh, her name is Alexandra Scott. So she did the initial look of Stealth Hammer working with me and her father and the, her evil uncle. Because I'm a guy yes. evil uncle. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so she helped flesh some of that stuff out. Um, she wasn't available when we actually were, uh, due to various reasons, she wasn't available when we went to go do the main issue. So okay. my wife, uh, being a graphic designer, had a lot of artistic friends and put the word out there like, hey, is there somebody that does comic book artwork? 
And <laughs> one of her old classmates reached out and says, yeah, my buddy Joel, he lives in Columbus. He does this for a living. And uh, she, he sent a contact. I got his, I saw his website, which had a lot of his artwork. And I <laughs> turned to my wife right away and said, this is the guy. This is, this is who we yeah, need. You know it when you see it. Yeah. That what's in your head, you are able to see on a page, which is, yeah. which is really cool. Very much so. Because I wanted someone that could do this like cartoony art style, but still very detailed. Yes. Uh, so there was gonna, details were going to be important. And he knocked out of the park every single time. Absolutely. Going back to the cover and the little robots is somebody from one of the branches says she needs one of those robots. <laughs> no, don't we all? Yes. <laughs> don't we I, all de I definitely could use eight of them, just like the doctor. Well, I was just thinking, I was like, why are we stopping at eight? I'm just thinking about all the things I have to do. Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm joined in conversation with local comic book writer, Ryan Drost. So how do you guys communicate? Do you, is this like a Zoom? Is it a monthly meeting, weekly? How does that process a shared doc in today's yeah. day and age so yeah. that you're constantly well, collaborating and getting it right before there's I don't know 10 pages drawn and you're like no 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 right <laughs> yeah so there is uh as far as communicating uh it's it's using all the technology you can imagine today uh right. and, then, and then just some common everyday ones which is a phone call uh <laughs> you know like yeah talking over the phone and, and idea and everything else. But much like most people do nowadays, it's, it, there's not even phone calls, it's text messages. He'll okay. send me a, a picture through a text message saying, hey, I was thinking about this. But yeah, we'll also use uh, uh, like Google Doc images, you know, to transfer images back and forth. He'll okay. show preliminary sketches of stuff. Uh, when we came up with Watts, the robot, who yes. is at the bottom down here, yes. um, he, uh, he must have, Joel must have drawn like about 20 different looking robots of all different types. And I gave him a very vague idea. And mm -hmm. again, it was one of those things where it's like, once you know what the right look is, it just clicks. And yeah. I was like, yep, that's the one. Let's go with that idea. And uh, he fleshed it out and everything else. So it's extremely collaborative. It's a lot of communication, like the text messages, emails. Um, and they'll sometimes be just random, like middle of the night text message, because either from me with an idea or from him with something he drew. So. Yeah. I, I was surprised when I looked at that front page, how many other people are involved. And so I'm like, the, there's a colorist, yeah. there's an artist, there's yeah. a letterist yes. or letterer. letterer. I, I, yeah. letterer. Yep. And I was like, the, it, it is a true collaborative. I mean, you start with the idea of this incredible story and then trusting others to be able to take what's in your imagination and translate it to a page. Yeah. Much, I mean, much like so many things in life, like I think with all of our jobs, we couldn't do any of our jobs without other people being involved. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I, I am the one that came up with the idea and wrote the story, but like, you know, my wife will read the story or Joel will read the story and they're reading it cold. So they'll come back with, you know, Hey, this wasn't clear. Or this doesn't make sense or change the wording. I'd recommend changing the wording okay. on this or something like that. Yeah. And we'll, I'll go through rewrites and, uh, but yeah, then Joel draws it and then, and he'll ink it, uh, which there sometimes there's an ink. That's a, sometimes a whole separate job is someone that just takes the pencil work and then inks it. Uh, yeah. and then, uh, you have a colorist and the colorist has people that do what's called flatting, uh, which is they map out where colors are going to go and in general and stuff like that and kind of lay it out for the colorist and then the colorist goes in there and really fine tunes all the coloring and everything and gives it that vibrant look that we were going for and that can change from comic to comic and then yeah. like you said you take that whole product and you send it to the letter and he's the one that does all the word balloons and sound effects and and stuff like that and it really is uh such a collaborative effort and such a and there's so many things that can go on in, <laughs> from start to yeah. finish because then it has to go to a printer too after that and they have to send like hey here's the proof here you know is this what yeah. it's supposed to look like at the end um, yeah and then it gets shipped to you and you physically are holding something that started off as just an idea well i know you and i were talking a little bit beforehand that you know when we first met it at fan expo almost a year let's get in a year no not quite a little bit under <laughs> yeah yeah been a while. And I can remember like being super excited and going, you know, making my first trip to a comic book shop as an adult and yeah. Carol and John's, they know, and they support the local community um, and very much support local talent like Ryan. Um, and I was amazed. I enjoyed the story then. 
And then I reread it again and to prepare to make sure I had everything ready for today. And I loved it just as much yesterday as I did the first time. And that's, I think the great thing is how much, and then I picked up on more things, more of the details. Um, do you want to, can you talk a little bit more about some of those things that yeah. you put on the page? Yeah. So uh, we were talking right before we started and, and one of the things for me when it comes to storytelling, like there's various people, you know, rules of thumb that people follow for how they're going to tell a story. For me, it's always been, um, I want the story to be something you can go back and reread. I want you to get yes. something out of it again when you're reading it again. So there's little plot points that I put in there, little Easter eggs that I place in there that are going to be important later. Uh, mm -hmm. We're working on issue three right now. And there's, for people that read issue one and two, there's a lot of payoff in issue three because there's things that you're going to see in issue three that yeah. pay back to issues one and two. Um, to also give you an idea on the cover of issue two right here, we have King Arthur right yes. there and you can see the sword he has. If you go back to issue one and look at the first page of issue one in her room, there is a sword hanging up on her wall. And that is the sword you would think it is for King Arthur with Excalibur. So there's a whole story behind why is that sword on her wall? Um, so I love putting all that stuff in there because I know it's going to be story elements down the line. And when someone reads issue 10 and sees something like, oh my God, I think that was in issue one, or oh my God, I think that was in issue three, and they'll go back and reread it and pick mm -hmm. up on things. Um, there's so many little Easter eggs in yeah. like in every single panel and every single page. Right. Um, issue two, I there's a little when you if you ever reread it, there's a little um, creature up in the tree of one of the panels that uh, is like a little eyeball with wings, and it's just this little red creature. And yeah. That plays a role down the line because there's a reason that that thing is watching them. And but you don't wouldn't notice it because it's just up in the this little tree in the little corner there, and it's but it was put there intentionally. So um, the police station, the names of things in there, the the police station in issue two is called Lioness. Mm -hmm. The first time we find out that that what the name of the town is because of course your police station is named after your town. Yes. Um, so Lioness again plays back into king arthur uh that is believed to be the last battle location of king arthur um so there's reasons that i put things in there it plays into her legacy it plays into her lineage um and uh yeah and my my artist constantly will be like uh so what did you want to name this judo studio and i'll tell him well here's what i want to name because i knew you had a name for it he said i know that you're not putting something in there yeah. just to be generic uh so there's yeah. always a reason for everything that's in the story. This is terrific. I'm I'm joined by local comic book writer Ryan Drost, and and this is fascinating to to talk to you and understand the process. So you have already kind of envisioned, you know, several issues down the road, right? right, right and you're right. just kind of issue by issue advancing the story. But I think it speaks to the value of comic books to go back and reread. I mean, a lot of us don't typically reread a novel. I mean, a few right. of us do, a few right. favorites, but like the genius behind comic books is that you go back and reread because there's something that you may have missed. Yeah. Or now we know to pay attention to the little creature on the right. panel. Right. I think that's really fun and it yeah. kind of builds fans along the way, but we're anxiously awaiting for issue three. Yes. Well, and that's, that's one of the things that's great about it too, is, is to your point, uh, yeah, I have my favorite novels that I, I love to read yes. and, and go back to, but they are time consuming. Uh, Correct. Comic books are typically not. You can usually read a comic book within 10, 15 minutes um, if you're really paying attention or if it's really wordy or something like that. Um, so if you want to go back and reread something because like, oh, I, that, I remember something about that and go back and read the other issue, like the past issue or something like you can do that and kind of get a little bit more out of it. So. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit in your story? You know, you have references to like King Arthur, you have references to mythology, there's references to technology. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about your interests in each of those areas? Yeah. So this is really like a love letter to everything that I love in storytelling. So like I grew up with like watching He-Man and Teenage Mutant mm -hmm. Ninja Turtles and Super Friends and uh, yeah. Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and all these just fantastic like Jim Henson type stuff and everything else. So I wanted to tell a story 
where I could really bring all these loves together. So I love superheroes. So my main character is a superhero, but she's not here like I'm going to go out there and patrol the streets and stop crying. Right. That's not, she's on a mission, she's on a quest. So I always okay. love the hero quest type story where it's like, they are sent on a journey they weren't expecting to go on. Yeah. Um, so kind of like the Hobbit, the unexpected journey, you know, it's so. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But then I, I wanted to include, like, I love, you know, like I said, I love things like Mega Man when I was growing up playing that video game. And uh, so I love like these crazy technology things that just couldn't exist in the real world. Like when you read Stealth Hammer, you can see like, yeah. there's a car that has all these attachments that come out of it. There's no way it all fits into that car. But I love that like, Hyperbole. Not yet, that. anyway. Right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Not um, yet. So, so I love like that over exaggerated technology and everything else, and and being able to uh, throw that in there. But then I am a huge lover of like world mythologies. Like if I learn, you know, a mythology from Africa, or I learn mythology from like mm -hmm. uh, Europe or South America or something, I love learning as much as I can about those things. So I wanted to throw some of those elements in there as well. Um, and then create some of my own mythology. Like there's characters in here that there's at least one I can think of that uh -huh. sounds like a real mytho mythological character and she's not, it's just, it sounds that way. So, yeah. um, so I love being able to do that and kind of make the characters my own, make them work Absolutely. The but for me, it was always story comes first. So if one of those elements would not have fit for the story I was trying to tell, I would not, have, I would have taken it out. But all well, of they all, yeah, they all intersect yeah. yeah, and dovetail so nicely. Yeah. And then my hope is, you know, that, you know, comics typically appeal to to younger age. However, I am a big advocate now and need to go to like comic book 101 uh, to learn more. But I think the great thing about the Stealth Hammer series is that it should pique interest for kids to learn more about King Arthur or yeah. to learn more about that mythology that you're referencing or to learn more about that technology. It's just that, that curiosity. Yeah. When I would, create. when I would hear names or read names in, in comics and things like that, I was like, okay, what is, what is that? I mean, I learned like large words also in comic books, yeah. like ones you would not imagine to be in a comic book. Uh, I, cracked up because my wife is someone that loves words and yes. one of her favorite words is perspicacious which means keenly observant mm -hmm. and one time I was reading a comic book where they had that word in there and it was just like a it was like a spider-man comic book and I was like <laughs> if I read that as a kid I'd be like what is this but you learn what the context of the word is by the other words yeah. around it and to your point you can look it up if you want to really yeah. learn what that word means or what you know, I use certain characters like um, I have the wolf rats in my in my yes. one story, and there's Chernabog and Bellabog, and those are light and dark gods in mythology, yeah. in Slavic mythology. And uh, I don't use them that way, but if you saw those names and you looked them up, you could learn all about them. So, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's amazing. Um, my favorite word is defenestrate. Oh, that's a fantastic one. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that one is used in comic books an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. This is, I think I may have missed the boat, but like it's never too late to come back to comics, right? Yes, absolutely. No, and that's the thing that's great is um, there's a lot of people like my generation that grew up with comics and there's a lot of comics mm -hmm. being, read, being created for us, um, those of my age. But then yes. I wanted to create something that anyone of any age could really enjoy. So um so I, I can push the boundaries a little bit with that. So I'm yeah. creating like all ages, like all ages was for me. I mentioned things like Labyrinth and Dark Crystal when I was growing up. Yes. Those had creepy moments in them, uh, yes. but they were still all ages. They were still something that anyone of any age could read. So I have like a character, uh, her name's Marzana, and she appears in the first issue. Yes. At the and, end. Yeah. yeah. And she is uh, the Polish deity of death and yeah. which already sounds creepy in itself yes. um but there's you know i thought about it and i was like well there's there's always been books like goosebumps and things like that that were totally geared for kids but they're they're creepy you know yes. so it's okay to have a creepy character but i remember my wife saying she saw the drawing of marzana and she's just like yeah this is for kids right and i was like yeah and she's like this is really creepy i was like that's okay <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I appreciate the fact that you're pushing the boundary, you yeah. know, and I think it's something that even, you know, like adults, you know, and kids could read together. 
Yeah. Right. And have some of those discussions about, you know, lightness and darkness and some yeah. of the history and that type of stuff. So yeah, great conversation course, starter. Absolutely. One I have, uh, it's, it's not very prevalent, uh, prevalent in the first two issues, but it's something that we will see as a theme as we go on is, um, the, the, the quote unquote good guys, mm -hmm. um, have nature and mythology working with technology. Okay. Um, the bad guys, uh, have kind of forced technology onto nature. So it's, it's, Ooh. so there's some themes of that. So you're going to get like cybernetic things and everything else where it's like, it's really forcing those two together. And, and it's just because like, I always feel like you can, you can use technology to work with nature. So I feel like that is a good thing. So I wanted to kind of have that be as a theme in, in the story that I was yeah. telling, like having these things work together, you can enjoy nature and still have your technology. Um, you don't have yeah, they're to. not mutually exclusive, but right. there is the tension that exists between the two of them. Yes, absolutely. So, so that was something that just kind of happened organically as I was putting the story together. So, but it was, it was a fun thing to have pop up. Yeah, terrific. I'm, I'm joined by local comic book writer, Ryan Drost. And so the next question is a little bit um, with regard to the technology, right? So her dad gives her a set of glasses that have GPS in them yep. and infrared. Yep. Right. You talk about some stealth technology to be yeah. kind of undetected. Um, you know, yeah, you're stuff that's not quite here just yet. Yeah. But we're on the fringes of a lot of that. So uh, it, it's exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, to, yeah so go ahead. It start, well, it started off as like uh, because I'm working with stealth hammer, I needed to figure out, OK, well, what's the stealth part of her powers? and What's the, the hammer part of her power? Hammer. Right. <laughs> So, um, so naturally stealth, the easiest thing to do is, okay, we're going to make her invisible. Well, how do we make her invisible? And so you have right. to start thinking about all of that. So yeah, there's, there's technologies out there that are helping us become invisible more and more every day. And, and really not only hide from like radar and everything like that, but literally like hide in plain sight. Um, so yes. there, there's a lot of technology like that. And that's the thing I always love with science fiction is like there's science fiction today but tomorrow it might be reality. <laughs> so yeah, that that's that's just it. So I have a question about your thoughts on artificial intelligence. Yeah. Right? Yes. I um. So I am. Uh, I'm mixed on that, as I think a lot of uh, creators are. I think it's a fantastic tool, or it can be a fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. Um. But I don't like the idea of it ever like replacing what people are doing. So uh, I've, I've used AI for little things here and there, like uh, an eBay listing that I don't want to really type up the right. whole description, but I can still edit it and change it. I think so it's, it's just like those little robots. We go yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, it's not AI. It's a, it's right. a robot doing some And work. I think AI can help yeah. with like inspiration for things because that's the thing too, is like nothing that I've written or put is technically original. There's really not a lot of original original ideas out there it's just different takes on things and themes that we've known for centuries yeah. um so i think ai can help you with like coming up with ideas and, and maybe a new take on something or, or just like inspire you so like i've seen ai art that i'm like oh my god that makes me think of this and it might spark an idea for a story or something right. like that but it's i yeah i never when i hear things like okay they're going to use ai for uh writing a screenplay or something like that for a movie i'm like i would never want to see that no. movie. <laughs> yeah. The, heart, the heart is taken out. Yeah, yeah, the heart is taken out of it, and that's really at the at the center of every single good story out there. There's always heart. There's always emotion. Yeah, well said. Um, joined by local comic book writer of Stealth Hammer, and we're talking a little bit about artificial intelligence. So I'm thinking, like, is artificial intelligence something that Jamie would fight, like, with or against or so I, the I'm trying to think like what would Jamie do, right? Yeah. So the artificial intelligence we have in Stealth Hammer is the, is kind of like the stereotypical artificial intelligence of sci-fi. They're they're personalities. They're robots that can communicate yeah. and they they serve a function. Uh, they're right. there to protect, or they're there to build, or they're there to you know do a task. Um, okay. And so I like that idea of like okay, we're using uh, computers. I mean, let's face it, we're using a computer right now to help get messaging out there and everything else. Absolutely. I like the idea of using. Yeah. AI and using robots and things like that to help us do things that we need to get done. And that's what her robots are there for. But they do have a personality. They do have 
right. you know, a life to them uh, and they, their characters in the story. Um, so with her, she she's very much wants to work with them. Um, but at the same time, what she's seeing or what she will be seeing is like she's seeing someone that wants to take over the planet um, and kind of impose his will onto everybody. So there's a difference between accepting others for who they are and letting them become part of your life versus something getting forced upon you. Tell you what, so much wisdom is packaged <laughs> into, you know, these comics, whether it's issue one or, you know, issue two, yeah. um, they're incredible stories. And when I started preparing for today, thinking about how layered it yeah. is, you know, you yeah. start with the, you know, simple. And then as you talk and you read and you discuss, it is, it is multifaceted. Yeah. It is so nuanced and it is just an incredible opportunity to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that we did was, uh, and it was very intentional. The first issue was very much like what, what is called in the comic world, like a golden age story where it's like mm -hmm. you get introduced to your character, they get their powers, they fight the bad guy end of story. But we plugged in a few little hints of things in there, but that's essentially what a golden age story was like uh, back in the thirties, forties, fifties, they okay. would just, the hero got their abilities. They fought the bad guys. Yay. Everyone wins. Um, and then when we get into issue two uh, and I had people that read the issues and, and they were like, that reviewed it and they're like, Oh, you are taking us in a completely different way. Like, cause when you get to issue two, you really find what the story is about. You find out it's about her legacy. It's about this history that she has that it goes much deeper than just, Hey, I got powers and I'm fighting bad guys. Um, yeah. So yeah, one of my favorite things in issue two, and I should be able to find it here pretty quickly because it's one of my favorite pages, um, is Joel drew this two page splash um, that had, it's the whole history of yeah. Jamie and her family. And it's told by Ari the Elf, who is one of my favorite characters to write. Yeah, he's um, cool. He's like hilarious, he's so much fun to write because yeah. he's just this snarky little I elf think guy. <laughs> I was going to say snarky and you beat me to it, but there's, there, yeah, it's quite fun. Yes. Uh, uh, and he has his own language. He talks in yes. third person. So he refers to himself all the time. Uh, yes. He doesn't use articles. So like he doesn't use the and uh and an and things like that. So like, oftentimes I have to write his dialogue out and then like kind of write it. He out. would say it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Although at this point, after two issues of writing now, it, he just lives in my head. So I can write his language, his dialogue, no problem. But yeah, he shows this whole history. He has this this scroll that he puts out, this, this magical scroll that just show, lays out this history. And when a reader gets to that point, they're like, that's when it's the, oh, this is a much bigger story <laughs> than what I read in that first issue. <laughs> Which, which is terrific because it makes me even more excited for what's to come. Yeah, yeah. So. And like, yeah, and the thing is like issue two, like issue one, a lot of action happened. Yes. Issue two was a lot of family and getting to know the story and everything else. Issue three, we're getting, uh, you're getting more of like the history of Ari the Elf, but you're, but we're getting back to a little bit of the action again. So like there's this ebb and flow of when you're telling stories, like you want those quiet moments where you're learning about the characters and, and each other and everything else. Yeah. And then you want those moments where it's just the action is happening nonstop and you're, and you're on for quite a ride. So we have a and little bit of both in the, in the third issue. Makes sense. When you have those moments of pause, those, those quiet moments, it certainly helps explain the action. You understand, yeah. you know, not just what they're doing, but what motivates them, why they're doing that, why they're choosing, you know, those particular. Absolutely. Yeah what's important to them. Absolutely. Um, so I'm joined by local comic book writer, Ryan Dross. This is so much fun um, talking to you um, and learning about the process um, even more. Um, super excited. Um, can you talk a little bit about issue three? Or yeah. Is it yeah, so issue three is kind of a throwback issue. Uh, they're on, at the end of issue two, they're on their way to Iceland uh, where Jamie is gonna get trained to be the hero that she needs to be. Um, so on the way, Ari, the elf, starts talking about how he came about seeing her and uh, getting involved in her life. And so we get this flashback story of Ari in the village. So we're going to see where he comes from. We're going to see all of his you know, family and uh, other mythological characters and everything else. And then we see his journey okay. to, 
to the United States and into Jamie's life. And uh, there is some moments that we see from issue one, but we see them in a different perspective in issue uh, three because it's, oh, that's it's, awesome. now, it's now Ari's perspective and where and how did he get there. And it's there's so many times that you're going to read issue three that you're going to go back and be like, wait a minute, I saw that character in issue one. And yes. you want to open up issue one again and see like, oh my God, that is the same character. So um, we have a lot of fun with that in issue three. That's awesome. Do do you have like a possible release date or is it too soon in the... So we're looking, so uh, we've always done the issues through crowdfunding. Uh, so okay. we do through Kickstarter. Uh, and so right now we're tentatively looking at January is when we're going to launch the Kickstarter. Okay. Which means it'll be uh, February, hopefully, that we'll reach our goal. And okay. then we'll be able to start. Uh, Joel's already working on pages. So he's like, awesome. I, he's like I, I yeah. want to get this going so that when we're done with the Kickstarter, we can get it over to the colorist and we can. So I would say probably spring, uh, sometime springtime of 2024, we should have the, the next mm -hmm. issue out. I know we were talking a little bit beforehand. Can you tell people about the website and what your plans are for yeah, the website? Absolutely. So the website is just stealthhammer.com. So nice and easy to find. Um, and on there right now, you can see the, like I mentioned, the original uh, page, uh, original artwork of my wife at Stealth Hammer. But you can also learn about the characters right now. The characters are all on there. You can learn a little bit about all of them. Um, mm -hmm. We're also going to add to the website more free content as far as like the world of Stealth Hammer and learning a little bit more about this whole world that I've just been talking about. Um, but I'm also going to start adding in um, some, sh some short stories that will be prose. Okay. So they won't be comic books, but they'll be short stories that you can read on there to learn more about some of these other characters that are in this world. And um, because we have so many that I can play around with and, and not worry yeah. about it impacting the main story. Um, so we can, you know, you can learn so much more. So I'm going to start doing that. Probably the first uh, chapter of the first short story will definitely okay. be out before the end of the year. So that's that's terrific. Certainly something to look forward to. So you can see on your screen at stealthhammer.com. Um, how do you keep track of all your ideas? <laughs> uh, a lot of it's up here, <laughs> but no, uh, there are a lot of. I'll take notes on my phone. Okay. Um, I will take screen captures, like if something inspires me for where the story could go. Um, especially that is very helpful because if I have an idea in my head of what I want a place to look like or something like that, I can, if I have a screen capture, I can send that to Joel and be like, here's what I have generally in mind and he'll make okay. it own and everything. But, um, but yeah, and then I, I have an outline for at least the first six issues. So I know the next four issues, exactly what's going to be happening pretty much beat for beat. Um, and then beyond that, I have, okay, we know at some point these characters can be introduced at some point, these characters, here's how that's going to happen. So while I might not know line by line what's going to happen in issues past issue six, um, I do know the main story points that we need to make sure we're hitting to get to introduce all these characters. And I do have an end in mind. Like I know what the last, I know what the last issue is. Uh, <gasps> what it's going to cover, what's going to happen in that last issue. It's oh, a, no. a big surprise. I will not reveal that. No, no, no. I will but, not ask because I want to be entertained the entire time. But, but it will be something that makes the whole story very cyclical. It make, it helps you bring you back to the, the very beginning of the story. So, um, so we, cause I will be playing around with time travel and all the fun stuff and everything else, but there is, yeah, there's, there is a big emotional moment at the end. Um, wow. that I know, uh, once the characters, once the readers get invested in these characters, they're going to be yeah. like, yeah. okay, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> so yeah, well, it speaks to your point earlier that every character has to have heart. Yeah. Right. And so it speaks to, you know, your perspective as a, as a storyteller. So I'm going to ask, um, joined by local comic book writer, Ryan Drost, right. Of Stealth Hammer. What's the coolest thing about being somebody who writes comics uh people's reaction that's the coolest thing so like someone reads it and uh their reaction to it like you just hearing you tell me like how much you enjoyed reading it the second time like that is amazing to me um i had a friend of mine who bought the issues for her son and she came and visited me at the same fan expo that you saw me at and she yeah. said that her son was in his room reading and she heard him laughing and she came in to see what he was laughing at and here he was reading my issue and he was laughing 
at a point that was funny in the issue and probably like, some little Ari snark. Yeah, it was definitely. Right? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it, was, it was when Ari stomped on uh, Jamie's boyfriend, Kyle's foot. He found, uh -huh. he found that hilarious. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's little moments like that that just mean so much to me. Like that, that my story is out there and someone's enjoying it. And then to hear yeah. that they enjoyed it is like just mind blowing to me. And I will always hope hopefully always treasure that just that little I, little thing so I, I i have no doubt that you will um since this writers unplugged is support uh, cleveland reads mm -hmm. why is literacy or reading important to you oh my god I, well comic books are especially are so helpful for reading uh mm -hmm. if you have someone that does not like reading try handing them a comic book because mm -hmm seeing the images and everything else kind of brings you into a world and then you want to read and learn more and reading comics then can lead into reading other stories um mm -hmm. i have loved reading since i was a kid my mom read me peter pan i don't know how many times when i was a little boy yeah. but I, oh, that was my bedtime story she's like you should have done something else you want me to read and like no I'm peter mm -hmm. pan and like we so that's still something that i treasure to this day like there's stories that impact you like that that it's like okay this sticks with you and it kind of molds who you are so mm -hmm. um yeah re reading is just like it gets to give you that escape it gives you like whether it's reading a real story of someone mm -hmm. that actually existed or it's something completely fantastical um mm -hmm. if it's something that like can give you a break from the reality we all have to live in sometimes exactly um but yeah it's it i can't credit enough like I've had so many amazing teachers and everything else that just like introduced me to things to read that I thought I would never like and absolutely adore now so um so yeah. you mentioned yeah you yeah. were always always a reader did you yeah. ever draw as a kid too oh yeah very much so I uh I actually loved drawing I thought of, I wanted to be a cartoonist at one time so okay. um which actually helps me sometimes because I can draw like a crude drawing of something and send it to Joel and be like, this is generally what I have in mind, but I know you're going to do like 20 times better than this. Yeah. Um, but at least I can draw something very basic and, and send it to him. Um, but yeah, I love, I would sit in my room for like three, four hours drawing. Drawing drawing and writing. Yeah. 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 Do you remember the first thing you ever wrote and drew? Yeah. I, the first thing I ever wrote and drew was a video game submission to Nintendo. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to create my own video game and yeah. I wrote the whole backstory to the character and drew out the, what the levels would look like. And I sent it to them and they sent it back to me with a very polite, uh, you know, rejection letter, but it was, it was very nice. And it was just saying like, you have a lot of imagination here and, yeah. uh, you might want to send them a couple issues of stealth hammer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine, you know? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, it was that was the first thing I remember. I remember vividly like writing a story for and like and then drawing some stuff to go with it. So it was like, here's what all the characters look like and stuff. How fun. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you remember that and you saved that. Yeah. No. For sure. So we'll go to the the final five questions, right? Yeah. What was your favorite comic growing up? Green Lantern. Uh, I am a huge fan of Green Lantern because uh, what, as a kid, I had a huge imagination and he could create anything with his imagination with using his ring. So, If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Telekinesis. Uh, so I love the idea of being able to move things with my mind. You can fly with telekinesis. So people that say flight, I'm like, yeah, I can do that too with telekinesis. <laughs> uh, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so being able to move things with my mind and have it come to me like yeah so telekinesis would be the thing that i would want do you have a favorite villain yeah the joker uh <laughs> i have loved the jo joker is my favorite villain of anything whether it's comics movies whatever um i have my degree in psychology and so the idea of a character that is completely chaos and just mad in insanity incarnate is like just yeah. the ideal character for me because he can do anything and it just makes sense in his world so yes what comic book hero would you like to make a guest appearance in stealth hammer oh, stealth hammer so uh there's a couple because i've always related this to one character from marvel and one character from dc the character from marvel was miss marvel 
uh, I feel like Stealth Hammer and Miss Marvel are very similar yes. as far as their okay. energy and, and enthusiasm and everything else. On the DC side, Star Girl, because uh, Star Girl Girl deals with legacy. Uh, she has a legacy of family, and she becomes a hero. So I feel like both of those characters would work very well with with my character. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring comic book writers? Um, write what you know. Um, so and and keep writing. Like if okay. uh, pra it's like anything else, practice makes perfect. So. I am a much stronger writer now in issue three than I was on issue one. Um, so keep writing, keep at it. Um, I'm a pen pal with uh, a, a kid in high school and he, he would be in high school now. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's been writing sh short stories and sending them to me and, and we just randomly got matched up and he's just a fantastic kid. And, uh, but yeah, read, uh, read a lot. That helps. Uh, you know, but write the things you know. Uh, like my character is based on my wife, and we have a dog in the in the story that it was based on my real life dog. And um, yeah. so while there's superpowers going on and everything else, it's it's also very grounded. The the grandmother is named after my mother in law, which was my my wife's mom. So um, yeah. so yeah, you want to bring in those elements of who you are into the stories that you're telling. Yeah, I uh, what I hear you saying is write with heart. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Cause that will resonate with everybody. Yeah. I mean, just like, I mean, it starts off very innocuous as so she's walking out of a dojo and you know, like who, you know, who hasn't experienced that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're just, you're just live. She's just living her life. She's just like, I'm taking my boyfriend home to meet my, my dad. And yeah. that, that goes completely different <laughs> than what she was expecting. <laughs> yeah. so, Kyle probably thinks so too. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too. Kyle is her boyfriend. Kyle is based off of me. So okay. sometimes putting your own, yourself into your story works. Uh, yeah, he uses uh, humor as a defense mechanism. He's sometimes a little awkward. Um, it, that's completely me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been an absolute pleasure um, having Ryan Drost, a local comic book writer. Um, Stealth Hammer issues one and two head out now to your local comic book shop partial to Carol and John's um, in West Park in the Cam's Corner neighborhood. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I want to say thank you to our tech team. Um, thank you to those who are watching or listening later um, and sharing your love of reading with one another. Um, Jen Jumba with Cleveland Public Library. Happy reading.